Now, I've been around, as I've said, for a very long time. And I'm going to come at the issue that you have chosen as your theme in an oblique way, as it were, by parables. And I want to start by saying that the remarkable age of technology in which we live, that the minister outlined, and he quoted, the different ages of technology into which we must position our age, they reach our time with a unity that we don't always recognize or think about. To win the war, the Allies had to develop a nuclear weapon and secure the remarkable power of nuclear fission. To deliver that weapon, they had to develop rockets. And to de develop the rockets and the complex mechanics and technology that they had, they had to develop micro-technology which would squeeze into smaller and smaller spaces the messages and send the signals that would deliver the weaponry. And when they developed that technology, they developed the technology that would then soon thereafter become absolutely instrumental uh, in the research that led to the unfolding of the human genome. Because we would not have had the brain power, we would not have had the time to do the analysis of the complex genetics that has gone on and has revealed the 33,000 odd genes in the human genome without the technology uh, analyzing the raw data. And so all the technologies, nuclear fission, uh, informatics and biotechnology are united. And they've become united in this remarkable technology that brings us all together tonight. And it's a very interesting thought, isn't it? Where you would have been in your lives, all the people in this room, all 500 of, you, of us, where we all would have been if there hadn't been this development of the internet. What would you be doing tonight? What would you be doing with your lives? They would have been very different. And we would have had these technologies waiting for us in the future. And it's a thought for us to ponder upon what are the technologies that lie just around the corner. If we think of the extraordinary developments that have occurred in our lifetime, what are the amazing developments that will grow out of these? Because everything is happening very quickly, exponentially, and as Newton said, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of those who went before in developing the technology that is the basis of your livelihood and your work and your fascination uh, and that is so important for our economy, for our imagination, for our well-being, for the pursuit of happiness which Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence said was the proper question, the proper, a proper pursuit of human beings. Now, I first came into contact with your technology when I was serving in the Law Reform Commission. And I was chairman of the Law Reform Commission, the first chairman, from 1975 until 1984 when I went back into the courts as president of the Court of Appeal of New South Wales. And then in 96, I became uh, one of the seven justices of our final national court, the High Court of Australia. But back there in those days in the Law Reform Commission, a government changed and the incoming government, the Fraser government, had a commitment to act on the protection of privacy. And the new Attorney General, uh, rather like Senator Conroy, was a man of intelligence, energy, imagination and gifts. And he was determined to get Australia into the action on protecting privacy. This was Bob Ellicott. And so he gave the Law Reform Commission the project. And during the project, the OECD in Paris set up an expert group 
to draw on work that had already been done on privacy protection in the Nordic Council and then in the councils of what was then called the Common Market and the Council of Europe and to draw on their enterprises for this strange new technology of uh, automated uh, data uh, that was then developing and to develop principles and laws on privacy which could span continents and by spanning continents become effective. And so I went to Paris for the meeting. I was elected the chairman of that group and the group had to marry some very diverse attitudes towards privacy protection, the very strong desire for protection in the countries of Europe because they'd been through the horrors of the uh, Nazi occupations and the, um, uh, the use that was made of just ordinary old manila folders with intimate private information that could be used to mean life or death. And then on the other hand of the room, other side of the room were the Americans with the First Amendment believing that there should be very little regulation and that the world would get better by simply leaving things alone. And we ultimately developed the principles, the privacy principles. Those principles were accepted in many countries of the world, countries that don't normally copy each other's laws. Countries like Japan, a member of the OECD, the Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, Australia, many other countries copied the principles of the OECD. But in the work of the OECD, we had formulated one principle which we thought was a proper principle for the protection of privacy in automated data systems. And it was the so-called use limitation principle. And it was unanimously agreed on by the OECD group. It was recommended to the member countries. It was accepted in the Australian Privacy Act of 1988. And it's one of the privacy principles in that statute. And the principle effectively was, simplifying it a little, that in order to protect a person's privacy, if that person gave personal data to the collector, the collector could not use that data for a purpose different from the purpose for which the person had given it, except by specific authority of law or by the approval of the data subject. That was the principle. And it was effectively a good and moral and ethical principle designed to keep people's control over the use that it was made of their information penumbrum. And it seemed entirely appropriate, recommended, put into law, and then along came Google and Yahoo. And when the new technology came along with its massive capacity to range through vast amounts of information, the notion that you could control this penumbrum of information about yourself, this zone of privacy around yourself, was very quickly overtaken by the technology. Because the technology was so manifestly useful for the users of automated systems that the notion of saying halt was like the notion of Canute who, under the instruction of his, uh, his officials, went down to the sea to try and stop the waves coming in. Canute, by the way, knew that he couldn't. The officials believed this was the kingly power. Canute went to show the limits on kingly power. And so the first parable, which I derived from my experience in the OECD group, is a parable I lay before the minister. And it's the parable that you can do what you can do and you can try to do the moral and ethical thing and you will be applauded and it is right that you should do that. But in the end, with a technology as vibrant, as energetic, as dynamic and as changing as the technology of the people in this room, there will ultimately be limits because the technology will outspan in its capacity the imagination of even the most clever lawmakers 
and you can get the best experts and the best information, the best data, and tomorrow it can be overtaken by advances in the technology. So there is no final word. <laughs> of course, that isn't a reason for doing nothing. To do nothing, to do nothing is to make a decision. It's very important to understand that. To do nothing is to make a decision to let others go and take technology where they will. So doing nothing isn't an option, but doing is sometimes only a short-term option. And that is the first parable.